Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to everyone. And welcome to the February 2024 Hyperledger Financial Markets Mortgage Subgroup Meeting. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to express our appreciation to the Financial Markets Special Interest Group and the Hyperledger Foundation for their ongoing support and making this group possible. I know as we go through this call, people are going to be joining and Karen uh, Tani will be joining us uh, as the call progresses. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, as always, please note that this meeting is being recorded and uh, is under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation. So we ask that everyone abide by the antitrust policy and the code of conduct. The antitrust policy states that we avoid discussions of company specific products and projects. We don't make negative remarks about other companies or products. And the code of conduct means that we that we treat each other with respect, don't discriminate and communicate constructively. We fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity, and inclusion. Everyone's welcome to our meetings, and this is intended to be an open forum for sharing ideas and having a constructive discourse. We'd like to express our appreciation to all Hyperledger members, and this slide shows premier and general members as well. If you're new, welcome, and feel free to introduce yourself in the comments, um, but lurking is more than welcome as well. I, I know I lurk on quite a few of these Hyperledger meetings. Here's our agenda for today. Um, we've covered the introduction, and next we'll go over some Hyperledger community information, and then we'll get an update from Karen Otani on Hyperledger's plans for 2024, and James will then give us an update on blockchain in the mortgage industry. Then we'll close with any questions and um, we may need to move some things around on the schedule. Uh, so please be fluid with us or please be uh, patient with us as the uh, agenda may change a little bit. So we always cover the slide at the beginning of each meeting and this is to reinforce that we're all on the same blockchain journey but we just may be at different points along that path. This group is meant to help everyone on their blockchain journey and to demonstrate the feasibility of blockchain technology through mortgage industry use cases. We want to define potential implementation path for the mortgage industry and answer some of the questions of what does a mortgage company need to implement blockchain and how difficult is it to implement a blockchain? The next several slides, I always mention for those that are new to the group or would like more information, but I'll go through those pretty quickly. This slide provides links to different resources, uh, the Linux Foundation, Hyperledger Foundation, Financial Market Special Interest Group, and then the second one from the bottom is the Mortgage Subgroup Wiki. Uh, this wiki contains the meeting notes for our groups, recordings from previous uh, sessions and curated articles about blockchain in the mortgage industry. These are great resources and we'll reference them throughout the call. If you want access to these resources, you will need a Linux uh, Foundation ID or LFID. This slide walks you through that. I'm not going to go over this, but it's just to provide you that information. You can also obtain a Hyperledger Fabric certification. I highly recommend that. And for those that are new to blockchain, here are some links to free blockchain training that I've taken myself, and I think it's very worthwhile. Uh, I want to remind everyone uh, about the Hyperledger 8th anniversary event on February 14th at 10 a.m. Eastern and 7 p.m. Pacific. We'll put a link in the meeting chat, but this is going to be a great opportunity to talk about some of the remarkable achievements of the Hyperledger Foundation, gain insights into the latest developments within blockchain and distributed ledger technology, and also to connect with some of the industry experts and trailblazers within Hyperledger. So highly encourage that you join and we will provide you a link. 
Okay, um, the next part of our agenda, I believe I'm just going to check to see if Karen has had a chance to join us. Yes, she has. So welcome, Karen. Um, she has sent us some slides. So what I'd like to go ahead and do is just uh, give Karen a, a introduction and then hand it over to her. Karen Otani is the Senior Director of Ecosystem for Hyperledger Foundation and has been with Hyperledger for six years. She plays an active role in building the diverse ecosystem of innovative companies, developing and implementing uh, enterprise blockchain in various industries. Her areas of expertise include digital assets, interoperability, near and dear to my heart, and blockchain's impact on different payment models. Uh, prior to Hyperledger, she worked as a strategic business manager in the blockchain practice at Tata. She's also worked on no, numerous overseas role with USAID, Chemonix International, and various social enterprises. She's also fluent in French, Portuguese, and Spanish, and she is on the road and has joined us. Hey, Karen. Hi. How are you? I, I am doing good. I think everyone's doing well on the call. Uh, how are you doing? Good. Can you see me? Yes, we can. And okay, can so I see and your switch. face. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and switch to your slide. Perfect. So I apologize, everybody. I am um, going to be doing this from the car. I'm on the way to the, an event in D.C. that came up unexpectedly on my schedule um that's quite popular so <laughs> i was able to get a ticket to it so i couldn't miss it but i also couldn't miss this so i'm you know doing what we all do these days uh multitasking things at the same time okay great well thank you for joining us karen and your presentation's up uh just give me guidance on how you'd like to go so i'll just turn off my camera so it's not distracting from the presentation um, uh, do you want to put it in the slideshow mode or shall I? It, it is in slideshow mode. I I'm sharing. Actually, oh, Marvin, that's not what we're, I see. Marvin, we'll st we're still seeing our presentation that we put okay. together. Let me, uh, stop the share and restart just to make sure. Okay. Can you guys see the new presentation now? Perfect. There you go. And if you put that in like full screen, it should present just like slides. There you go. There you go. Okay. So you can go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity. Um, you know, I know this audience can sometimes be people who are new to the Hyperledger um community. Um or who maybe are more honed in specifically on the mortgage, um, you know, e e ecosystem. So I want to provide a little bit of an overview of Hyperledger itself. Um, you know, who we are. So Hyperledger's mission is really about building better together, and together being, you know, a key word in that tagline. Um, we are the home for open source. Uh, enterprise grade blockchain technologies um, that are really at the forefront of uh, what enterprises and organizations and governments are doing with with this technology um, and you know more and more serving as part of the basic infrastructure as well. Next slide. We are a part of the Linux Foundation so Hyperledger Foundation is, um, an umbrella for several different open source code projects. And the Linux Foundation is itself also an umbrella for many different open source foundations, um, working in different technologies from those in your phone, in your car, in your computer, um, in movies even. So um, Hyperledger is the sort of DLT blockchain home at the Linux Foundation for um, what's being done there, but we, um, you know, leveraged and built upon the best practices that the LF has been doing for many years. Next slide. 
And our key um, three main things that we focus on, obviously open source, that's I think clear. Most people know and are aware that our technologies are free for anyone to use and participate in. But um, an additional sort of nuance that maybe people aren't as familiar with is open development and open governance. Um, open development re really is all about how you know anyone can uh, get involved in the development of the code um, in becoming a maintainer. Um, and open governance is really about how the, the code itself how uh, the direction of what each project is taking, the roadmap is also open as well and not decided by any sort of, um, you, know, you know, closed group of companies or company. Um, as um, Marvin mentioned, we are celebrating eight years uh, and we have this event that we would invite you to join us. Um, I also have a slide on it as well. Um, so we've been around, you know, since the really the beginning. Um, and uh, we see Hyperledger as having really shaped the enterprise blockchain ecosystem. Um, and these are just some figures that can support that influence. So. We have eight projects that have graduated, five that are incubating, and um, even more that are in the labs. Um, these are uh, innovative young projects that sometimes eventually become incubating or graduated projects. We have a number of special interest groups along you know, various topics such as this one. Um, regional chapters, so we're, we're you know, very, very global. We have communities that are active in um, the Americas, in Brazil, in Japan, in India, um, really everywhere. So um, it's, a, it's a truly global community, as you can see as well by the number of meetups and participants. Next slide, please. And while, you know, this group focuses on a very specific topic of use cases, um, our technologies are being leveraged and applied in production use cases in almost every industry that you see here. Um, so there's a lot of examples of this on our website with our case studies, which I encourage you to take a look at. These are um, production examples. And then we also have, <laughs> excuse me, a use case tracker um, uh, that includes, uh, you know, advanced stage projects in a variety of industries as well. So I encourage you to look at that too, if you're interested in what's happening outside of the mortgage space. Um, as a foundation, we are, uh, we are a membership organization. We are, um, our activities, our events, our staff are all funded by our members, um, which allows us to provide the technologies free and open for anyone to use. Um, allows us to um, build the communities that the, the technologies um, uh, benefit from um, and that companies then benefit from by uh, leveraging and building their products and services on top of. So um, next slide, please. We have premier members, we have general members. Um, these are all companies that are um, using Hyperledger, building a Hyperledger or just supporting supporting, um, you know, the enterprise ecosystem and, uh, and open source technologies being available for them. Next slide, please. We also have associate membership for governments and institutions. Um, and we announce our new members um, on uh, about a quarterly by monthly basis, basis. So keep an eye out for new members that are joining. Next slide. Um, a big part of why companies join as members is because they are building products and services on top of our code that are critical to their lines of business, which means they want to make sure that that code and that community um, that is building that code has longevity and sustainability to it, um, isn't tied to the future of any one organization, is um, vendor neutral, and like I said earlier, um, uh, developed in the open and governed in the open because they feel um, more secure in uh, the future of the uh, of the code that they're using um, 
with that uh, framework. Next slide. And when you join as a member, um, you get access to our in-house experts, such as our team, um, a lot of community tools and resources, introductions um, within our community. We have a number of member only events, including a member summit that happens once or sometimes twice a year, like it did last year. And then like the case studies that I pointed to on our website earlier, we do a lot of content creation with our members as well, speaking opportunities, things like that. So um, if it's something you're interested in, um, please reach out. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we've really been here since the beginning of the blockchain space, um, building and shaping the enterprise market. Um, and we are open, global, and trusted as a result of that. Next slide. This shows you the timeline of some of our projects that uh, when they became, you know, were contributed to Hyperledger. Um, so from the very beginning in 2015, we had uh, Fabric and Iroha. Then um, as we went along, Digital Identity and Indie, um, Codebase has contributed Cello, which is um, uh, a tool that you can leverage with Hyperledger Fabric. Um, and then as we move along, you can see just the progression and addition of all the projects that you see there today. Um, now there is a project life cycle. Um, some projects may have been contributed in the past that you don't see here anymore. Um, and that's because they, they have been archived. Um, that's just uh, a normal part of the project life cycle. Um, sometimes projects, uh, you know, are, uh, reach a natural end, they've fulfilled their purpose. Um, and sometimes just, you know, there isn't a need anymore for that project or there isn't a community around it. Um, and so we, we have a, a method um, in our open governance. Um, this is discussed in, in public meetings where um, it, there's, a, there's a discussion about archiving. So some of those, um, uh, you know, may not be there here, but that's what we have today. Next slide. This slide I wanted to highlight just because, you know, um, there's always been a lot of interest in the Ethereum community. It's a huge developer community. And um, a lot of people are using and interested in Hyperledger Basu today. Um, and while Hyperledger Basu was contributed to the foundation in 2019, um, we actually had, uh, you know, Ethereum participation and uh, support um, since 2016, 2017. Um, so even earlier, there was this project called Hyperledger Bro that was honestly ahead of its time. And um, uh, uh, it, it allowed for you to use, um, you know, EVM with uh, different ledgers. Um, and, and since then, though, BASU was contributed. We've got, you know, EEA and EF as part of our community. Um, we've got an EVM Fabric Labs, Solang is a Solidity compiler, um, and Hyperledger Basu is um, one of the main Ethereum mainnet clients. Um, uh, there was recently some news that came out about um, some events around the Ethereum client diversity, um, and you know, Basu is one of those uh, uh, EVMs that contributes to the client diversity and thus the um, security of the e Ethereum mainnet. Next slide. So these are our current graduated projects. Um, you know, you can find more information about these on our website. I'm just going to highlight a few that maybe, um, you know, are of interest. I know I, I didn't, I'm not highlight, highlighting fabric because I, th I think that's a code base that this community is already familiar with um, and has used. So, um, but of course, Fabric is, you know, one of the most widely used DLTs out there, um, uh, has been used in more production ca use cases than any other um, uh, permission DLT. So, so I'm highlighting on the next two slides. Um, ones that you may be, uh, you may want to learn about. So as I mentioned earlier, Hyperledger Besu, this is um, 
a, a client of Ethereum, it has both public and private options. Um, you can use all Ethereum smart contracts and token uh, standards on it. Um, it's being used a lot currently by the financial industry um, because um, you know a lot of uh, companies in that industry want to be able to work in both public and private spaces um, and don't necessarily want to make a decision on that right now, but want to have a future option. So um, you're, you'll see bases being used in a lot of, um, for example, um, there's the city, city just launched their token services with Maersk. Um, they're using that. Um, Finality, if you've heard about Finality's um, sort of uh, I, like holes, they're acting as like a, 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 a what am I, how do I say it? manufactured wholesale CBDC um, between the, the the private sector. Um, that's leveraging Hyperledger Basu. Um, uh, the Swift CBDC sandbox is as well. So there's a lot going on with Basu right now. Um, yeah, next slide. Hyperledger cacti. So uh, interoperability is a challenge that everybody's always wondering about. How do we do this? Um, and Hyperledger cacti was um, uh, was a, a team of people from Accenture, Fujitsu, and IBM came together at one of our Hyperledger events, our global forum, and they said, you know, let's let's actually get to work on this and um, figure out a way to make this happen and um, Cacti is very is a bit different than um, some of the other interoperability tools you might be hearing out there, like Bridges, which has gotten a bit of a become inf infamous. Um, this is not about creating these um, sort of specific one to one networks or creating a network of networks. Um, uh, Cacti takes a, a very different approach um and uh provides these uh solutions that allow them to adapt um to new protocols very easily so there's currently connectors um between uh fabric basu corda um and then a few with some public chains too as well I encourage you to take a look at cacti um and and harmonia was a lab that was actually just contributed by r3 um, that also is is a complementary interoperability tool as well. Next slide. Hyperledger Fly Firefly. Um, this is a a really useful project for you to get to know if you're looking for some more, um, you know, abstraction from the um, sort of layer one um, uh, work that there is. It allows you to to launch um networks very easily as they like to call themselves the, the open source gateway to web3 um because it's a complete stack for you to be able to build and scale web3 applications and um you know just get launched to production uh, fast connecting to legacy systems so um this was contributed by our uh, member hyper uh Kaleido. And um, and they recently reached uh, uh, last fall a uh, graduated status of a blog there if you'd like to catch up on that. Next slide, please. Um, there's a, a, a number of thought leadership that Hyperledger Foundation engages in, um, some of it around you know the case for open source or um, or uh, Late as of late, central bank digital currencies. We have a ebook that I encourage you to um, scan the, the QR code right there, and hopefully it works. <laughs> um, and uh, take a look at it um, if you're interested in how our technologies are being used for uh, CBDCs. This is a nice overview. Um, you know, there's about I think there's like 17, 18 examples in there. Um, so quite a few of the um, uh, research and pilot projects and even live CBDCs um, that are out there in the world are using um, either Hyperledger, Fabric, Basu, Cacti, or Firefly. 
I need real hot as well. This is a map um, of th that you'll find in the ebook that that um, has all the examples you'll find in, in the book of of where hyperledger technology is being used. You can kind of see we have the little logos um, mapped everywhere. And um, it just shows, you know, open source really is something that governments are valuing for their research on this use case. So, you know, you're already involved by being here at the mortgage um, subgroup of the financial market SIG, um, but there's other ways that you can get involved if you have um uh you know any interest or connections with latin america um or brazil we have regional chapters there that are really vibrant communities that put, put together lots of good content presentations but also do sometimes they're they're doing hackathons sometimes they're doing um different series uh speaker series or learning series um the india chapter is is prolific um they're really a model for um you know an engaged community um so i encourage you to take a look at that as a way as another way to get involved next slide please um as marvin mentioned we have this upcoming event we are celebrating eight years um and we really wanted to take this moment to reflect and bring some really um, you know, high profile leaders from our community that have been a part of our history and are also a part of our future. So um, please register and join us on Valentine's Day. Back one, please. So um, we have a number of workshops. You know, if you're, I, I highlight a few of our projects, we have many others. Um, one way in which we get in, we help people get started is through these online or sometimes in person workshops. Um, they're recorded, so um, the ones that I highlighted in green here are upcoming. Um, so I want you to, I mean, I think one, one is basically going on right now. <laughs> um, so you'll you can catch the recording for that. Um, but uh, we have a zero knowledge proof um, that's coming up in April. Um, the other ones are previous ones that have been recorded. So these these often get very in depth. They're you know two to four hours long. Don't get intimidated by that. It's not boring. Um, it's it's for it's made for people who really want to get into the details and not and move beyond the surface level information on on these projects and and applications. Um, webinars are, uh, you know, typical one hour, so more like giving you a highlight of a, a use case or something that one of our members did. Um, these are um, our members that are sharing what they're doing with our technologies. So I encourage you to um, to sign up for these. Another way to get involved and get your questions asked. And so when you're wondering, like, let's say you, you go to one of these workshops, you watch a recording, but you get stuck on something. Um, the place to go is Discord. This is where our, our open source community um, communicates and meets. There's a channel for, for almost everything you can imagine in there um, that you might need help with. Um, why is it, why do companies get involved? Cause you know, sometimes it, it seems like, oh, well, what, you know, what, if I'm not really sure what I want to do or, or what I want to build, if I'm not building anything, you know, why use open source? Why get involved in our community? Um, you know, this is a question I get a lot. So I thought I'd kind of preempt it here. Um, you know, all, y y y Leveraging existing um, infrastructure, existing um, uh, foundations um, that are not where you compete on helps you decrease time to market and accelerate the work on a project you're doing. Um, you'll, uh, as a developer um, or a technical person, you gain experience um, working in open source um, that also makes you very hireable. 
um, that, uh, and for companies, you know, that means you're building an in-house expertise as well. Um, that's very valuable. Um, like I said, everyone's on discord if you need help. So you can tap into this, this much broader community, um, that's there to help, you know, you know, from their own goodwill, essentially to a certain extent, obviously. Um, and more importantly, is like, if you really get involved, you can help shape the direction of what the project is working on, um, um, to fill, to fill your needs, um, and your use case. And, um, and you help make sure that this is something that's going to continue. And, and if it's something you're leveraging for, um, your use cases, it will be, um, there will be longevity to that community and to that code. Next slide, please. So, um, I, you know, love to hear what you all are interested in, um, you know, in terms of what our outlook is for 2024. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more, we have a lot more workshops planned, um, both virtual and in person on um, the topics that we find we're hearing a lot of interest from. So you'll see, um, and and also just repeating ones that I think we found successful last year, you'll, you're gonna find workshops on CBDCs, on BASU, on Fabric um, uh, coming up this year as well. So, you know, sign up for our newsletter on our website so that you can be abreast of when those are available. Um, another thing that I think you'll find, like just in general topics that we see of interest, there's going to be a lot of, I think, discussion around CBDCs, um, you know, applications in financial services, um, and also, you know, things related to zero knowledge and privacy as well, um, as there's a lot of interest. That's why we have a, a workshop um, coming up on, on that topic itself. Um, we will be doing our uh, a member event at the end of October. Um, we'll be announcing that very soon. Um, that is a member only event. So if you want to attend that, you obviously have to be a member. Um, and then we will be having a presence of a lot of upcoming industry events. So um, we haven't made final decisions on all, all those just yet, but, um, but you know, it's some of these major ones that are coming up, you will see Hyperledger there. So we invite you to come um, join us at the event. Um, our members can join us at our booth um, and come say hi to us if you happen to be there as well. But you'll hear more about that on our website um, under events when those are officially announced. And these are just, you know, all the different ways in which you can kind of engage and get information or reach out to us. We're all always open and available to chat and talk and help whenever someone in the community needs. So I can, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, if there's any questions, let me know. I'm happy to clarify anything. Uh, thanks, Karen. That was great information. This is Marvin. I, I do have uh, one question for you. Um, in 2023, there was the whole crypto winter that I think impacted a lot of what was going on within blockchain, not just from a crypto perspective, but within the past month or so, it seems like things are beginning to gain, gain traction again, but with a slight twist. You mentioned Bisu quite a bit, and I, what I'm starting to see is there is a lot of interest, but from a more Ethereum perspective. So using that as a token, using Bisu, in what, what do you think about that? What are you seeing out there? Because that, that's what I'm interpreting from what you just mentioned. So what in, in terms of the shift out of crypto winter? Yeah, yeah. And, and how things are gaining traction, but from an Ethereum perspective, uh, at least mm -hmm. that's how it seems to be starting. Yeah, I think I I think that, you know, things are are definitely um looking up. Um, I think some of that also has to do with, um, 
you know, uh, more and more kind of clarity on regulations and what governments are doing. Um, the, the event I'm actually um, going to is at the OCC. Um, uh, there's a whole event there on tokenization. And I think that that also really um, gives more, you know, confidence and stability in, in the industry overall. We are, we are lucky in that we're some, somewhat, you know, um, sheltered from the ups and downs of crypto. It definitely affects, you know, um, invest, the investments that companies make or um, the, uh, sorry, hold on. <laughs> sorry. Um, it definitely affects the, um, the way enterprises, you know, how they uh, focus their resources. But, you know, being that we are in, not in the, like, specifically the crypto space, um, even when there is a crypto winter, you know, our, our work continues. Um, because our work is really, um, while there is definitely a lot of connection to financial applications um, uh, and, 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 you know, things related to crypto, but more so like, you know, existing infrastructure, in existing financial infrastructure, like payments and currencies and things like that, or um uh you know the way that the uh private uh institutions work together so um i think there is somewhat that that work still continues because this is about changing um the way uh companies work um even in whether or not it's related to uh the crypto space right um this is about building your um network of supply chain like our trust your supplier this has been really successful continuously trust your supplier continuously wins awards that's built on hyperledger fabric um there's just a, there's just a lot of um diversification in our community so for us the work has always continued but um you know we certainly see a big change happening um with things looking more positive for the crypto space Okay, great. Uh, thank you. The, there was a question in the in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and answer it, uh, and then if you want to chime in a, as well. Uh, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Alan asks, I believe that the mortgage industry is one of the focuses of this subgroup, but from a quick scan of members, I only recognize Accenture and Integra. Are there other mortgage-related members that um, Alan may have overlooked? Uh, Alan, there are several other mortgage companies, uh, specifically Estaca Paza, for example. I believe that they are a member of Hyperledger. The, I think they joined recently. They actually presented a couple months ago. Uh, uh, JP Morgan Chase, B of A, uh, they're the large financial institutions. Uh, they also participate uh, within Hyperledger, and we've had some of them uh, join us on uh, the mortgage subgroup a, as well. In Karen, was there anything you wanted to add or or James as well? Yeah, you know, actually, I was going to add to that, Marvin. Um, we, there's a numerous other companies out there, Alan, that are working in the blockchain space. They may be involved with Hyperledger. They may not, but definitely there are other companies. If you go back through our presentations over the last three years, you're going to see highlights for those. If you take a look at the wiki, I'll be talking about that in a moment. Um, you'll find highlights from those as well. And in a few minutes, I'll give an update on the, the mortgage industry. And I've actually got several of those topics I'll be covering today. Hey, and Alan, I, I see you're asking about the name. So uh, I may have tried to answer that question too focused. Uh, I just mentioned companies or mortgage companies that are members of Hyperledger. But as James alluded to, there are a ton of mortgage companies that are involved in Hyperledger, in blockchain, and have presented to this group. And James will cover those. You can take a look at those that are with you as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm you know, I definitely, that... I definitely wish there were more. Um, <laughs> um, 
and you know why that is it may be that you know um what they're working on is um you know more in-house things that they're not necessarily sharing publicly um and so we haven't engaged with them um it may be that they're using you know other technologies and are haven't explored hyperledger yet um although i do think a lot were a lot have have used fabric in the past so um uh there, there's a myriad of, of reasons but i definitely you know would love to see more and, and encourage uh more companies to you know take a look at what's happening in our space i think it's pretty significant um and if you're not you're missing out yeah absolutely um i think one of the things that i did want to stress is just the advantages of hyperledger uh, Fabric and um, uh, Firefly. There are so many tools out there. I think what Karen really underscored is there are so many channels uh, and avenues and sources of information from a Hyperledger perspective that allows you to get up to speed and build things within Hyperledger that you may not be able to within other blockchain <laughs> platforms. But I, I, I don't want to venture too far into that. But if you do want to have a side discussion with me about how we've been able to build within Hyperledger and reach out to me and I can definitely tell you and I can, um, James and I can give you a, a ton of names of the other mortgage companies that are working within blockchain and Hyperledger specifically. A and then there was another question, what are the opportunities for a newbie within Hyperledger? In Karen, I, did you wanna answer that? Um, I know you're, you're at another event, so I don't want to. Yes, of course. I'll have here, to right? run. Yep, I'll have to run in a second. But um, opportunity. So if you're if you're a, a technical person, we have um, a lot of different trainings. So I encourage you to look on our website and check out some of the online trainings that we have. The workshops that I mentioned as well. Um, and then uh, definitely, definitely join the Discord where you'll see the community meeting. Don't be shy. Don't be afraid. They're very welcoming. They're open. Um, it's totally normal to have new people show up and ask questions. Um, that's what this community is all about. There are also, um, uh, once maybe you get past the beginner stage, you've taken some courses, you could start even joining some of the contributor calls. Um, and, you know, engage in discussion about what's happening in the fabric community. So um, that's where I would say get started. The other thing I would say is look up wherever you're based, look up, um, uh, just Google Hyperledger meetup in your city. And um, there's May, if it's, in, in what, if it's in a major or even a mid-sized city, we have a lot of meetup groups there because um, there you'll find um you know local people that you could connect with they often do in-person events um that you can connect with to help you on your learning journey as well and then once you start building something um come tell us about it let us know because the thing with open source is that anyone can use our technology so we don't always know what people are doing with it unless um you know they come and share it with us so let us know what you end up doing uh, thanks, Karen. That that was a great answer. And one thing I just want to toss out there, just go on GitHub, do a cert, Hyperledger, whatever type of application you're thinking of building. Chances are someone's already taken a run at it, or at least there's uh, quite a bit of information out there. So check out GitHub. Um, and before I go, Alan, who I think asked some of the other questions, you know, if you want to um, talk more about whatever it is you're looking to do or want to learn more about the community please you know feel free to reach out to me um you can reach me um more sim simply i mean my my email's kind of long so membership at hyperledger.org is is easy to remember um and you know feel free to email me there if anyone wants, has any follow-up questions okay great uh thanks karen we definitely appreciate it you joining us, uh, you've given us a wealth of information and really interested to see what else Hyperledger is gonna be doing in 2024. So thank you. 
Great. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, hope it was helpful. And um, we'll see you online or in person somewhere in the world. Thank you very much, Karen. Your support and the support of the Hyperledger Foundation has been fantastic. We greatly appreciate it. Okay. Thank um, you as well. Th thanks, Karen. Uh, now, going on to the next portion of our agenda, the status of blockchain in the mortgage industry. I think, Alan, you'll find some of this information really interesting. James always does a fantastic job of giving us an overview. So take it away, James. Thank you, sir. Let's go ahead and bump up to the first slide. Um, I've actually got a lot to cover today, so I will move pretty fast. Uh, you know, the fortunate thing, all of this information and more is available from our wiki site. But, you know, during uh, Karen's presentation, you guys heard about Hyperledger Bezu. I thought this would be a great way to, you know, open our discussion today. The first articles from Mark Lewis, he's the managing director at Kaleido, and he really discusses the advantages of Hyperledger, Hyperledger Bezu. Um, he goes into a variety of different case studies, as you can see by the article, covering everything from supply chain to identity management, voting, healthcare, you name it. Three of the big topics that really focus for this group, the first one was in banking and finance, discussing decentralized finance applications like payment systems, asset management, and smart contracts. Um, and how Hyperledger Bezu provides secure and transparent financial transactions, reducing cost and complexity. He also has a use case related to real estate and blockchain-based real estate transactions, reducing, reducing the risk of fraud, simplifying the over proce overall process, and reducing costs. And, you know, those are themes that we hear continuously throughout our, our blockchain journey. And then the third one is really around digital identity, allowing users to manage their personal data securely and privately on the blockchain, particularly useful in both the finance and the healthcare industry. It's a great article with some great use case scenarios. I'll admit it is a little bit of a sales pitch for Kaleido, but I do think that the content is worth taking a look at for this group. The second article, this is actually coming out of a company called Block BR, which is located in Brazil. Block BR is a company that develops tokenization infrastructure. And the, the article is really about the investment potential being developed through real estate tokenization, utilizing fractionalized investing. So asset owners can split them into hundreds or thousands of tokens with very low value. This allows smaller investors to participate in the market and have greater gain, greater gains than the CBDCs and savings accounts. The token is produced and traded on a blockchain platform with high quality security, total transparency and agility, and it eliminates financial intermediaries between the public and the bidders, which reduces the overall operational costs. Token platforms work around the clock, providing users with the ability to buy and sell tokens at any time, day or night, from literally anywhere on the planet. Fractional real estate tokens allow diversification of portfolios, investors pay less, and distribute their capital into other assets. This article, too, is a bit of an advertisement for Block BR because the Block BR platform is where, they're util or where Brazil is trading these real estate tokenizations. Um, but we have been, as you guys have seen over the last year or more with several of the articles, we're seeing more and more of this type of activity, um, not only, you know, in South America, but we're seeing it in Europe, we're seeing it in uh, Asia, we're seeing it in the Americas. Uh, next slide. Okay, this next article is from the Scotsman Guide. I actually found it a, a fairly interesting article. It covers a lot of the topics that we've covered over the last probably year and a half to two years now. Um, opens up with a lot of statistical information. So you'll remember previously we talked about the Fannie Mae survey that was out there that pulled hundreds of senior mortgage executives in 2021. Um, as you'll recall, 25% of those respondents were at least somewhat familiar with the blockchain concept, but 68% had yet, yet to consider using it in their organization. 
In addition, we've also seen production expenses hit a record high of about 13,000 per loan in the first quarter of last year, according to the Mortgage Bankers Association, which is well above the long-term average that we've been seeing of 7,000 or so per loan. They talk about the McKinsey report that we covered, revealing customer satisfaction scores around the mortgage industry are between 30 to 40 percent lower than under other industries. And then last summer, we talked about the Mismo uh, blockchain lab that's been set up, and they estimate that blockchain could reduce closing times about 30 percent and overall costs relative, relatively around 25 percent. And then one of the last statistics they were talking about, actually, CoreLogic analysts believe that efforts to integrate blockchain are likely to be bumpy and slow moving. Um, tools such as digital asset verification, employment verification, income calculators, they've all faced opposition from originators and underwriters in the past. And although blockchain has not developed widespread adoption in the industry as of yet, there are some prime examples of successful integration. So we've talked about figure technologies. They originated more than $6 billion in HELOC loans and recently began partnering with independent mortgage banks on proprietary HELOC products with a 100% digital application process. We also last year talked about Redwood Trust subsidiary Corvass. They securitized $313 million in single family uh, rental loans with blockchain provider Liquid Mortgage, providing the ability to track daily loan level payment activities. So uh, a great article from the Scotsman Guide going into a lot of the details um, of those and other transactions that have been occurring. A lot of them tie up to what our presentations have been over, as I said, probably the last year, year and a half. The next article, kind of sticking with that AI theme that we were talking about last year, you know, how does blockchain and AI work together? This is coming from the Blockchain Council, and it's actually pretty, or was published on LinkedIn. It is a very high-level article. It starts out with an overview of both blockchain and AI technology. It identifies the common ground between blockchain and AI, so the data quality, security, the decentralized TARP type of uh, architecture, utilization of smart contracts. But then it delves in a little bit more focused on first, how does blockchain enhance AI? So some of those topics include data security and integrity. So if blockchain's immutable ledger ensures data is highly secure, and this security aligns perfectly with AI's need for trustworthy data sources to make accurate predictions. There's the decentralization aspects of it. There's the transparency and uh, accountability aspects of it. Um, blockchain enhances accountability and AI-driven decisions, providing increased confidence in the AI algorithms. It then also looks at how does AI enhance blockchain through security monitoring and threat detection, through enhanced data analytics, through the use of smart chain or smart contracts and automation. Um, for instance, efficiencies of interactions between AI and blockchain, AI can analyze data, assess real world conditions and trigger specific actions with smart contracts on the blockchain. And then lastly, he touches on real world use, can, use case scenarios of blockchain and AI collaboration in a couple of different industries in the supply chain industry, the healthcare industry, but then also within the financial industry, they discuss examples of blockchain and AI are in use in a variety of examples, including smart contracts, AI algorithm utilization, and peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. So again, if you're interested in AI and seeing how AI and blockchain can work together, this is a uh, great article that touches upon it at a high level. And then moving on to the last slide, Marvin, and I see we're, we're getting down to the last five or six minutes. So this last one, this was the Q4 Friends of Providence blockchain update. It was actually a, a live presentation on January 24th I was able to attend, but there's a link to the article uh, within the wiki. Um, on the slides, you can see the operation metrics reported by the Providence Blockchain Network for 2023. 
The highlights include year-over-year -year transactions were up 156% to more than 4 million, or yeah, more than 4 million. They ended 2023 with 9.4 billion in total value, all of which is in real world assets like loans, private uh, company equity and private funds, which I thought was actually a very interesting observation. This is up 29% year over year. In addition, at the end of 2023, there were a number of bonded tokens, or the number of bonded tokens doubled year over year also by roughly about 11%. So, you know, as we've seen, um, and as even Karen mentioned in her presentation, currently there is an uncertainty in the legal, the risk, regulatory uh, environments out there related to blockchain and its utilization. The Blockchain Foundation, one of the things they talked about in their update is they're going to be spinning off Prove Labs with the, from the foundation with the foundation remaining a nonprofit, which is going to continue to focus on these issues of risk and regulatory and legal, while Prove Labs will become a for-profit working with firms and fintechs that are looking to migrate onto the Providence blockchain. You know, the biggest news announcement I think they had over the last year was the Monetary Authority of Singapore's Project Guardian. So back in November, we briefly mentioned JP Morgan's Onyx Digital Asset Team working with Apollo and Wisdom Tree enabled fund managers to tokenize funds into a private permissioned instance of uh, the Providence blockchain, JP Morgan's Onyx platform, and Avalanche. Wealth managers were then able to sell, buy, and rebalance thousands of separately managed positions across the three blockchain systems. And this could have a significant impact on an industry that's valued at roughly $5.5 trillion. Also, they discussed new features that were coming out or that were released in the month of January, um, the hold modules and the exchange modules. And then at the very end of the article, they do uh, touch upon an update on their grant program. Uh, they have issued $4.7 million in hash grants to recipients. What I highly recommend, this is about a 14 minute read, but they do have the video recording from the hour long webinar that was in there. I highly recommend checking out the, the hour long webinar because a good 20 or 30 minutes of it is dedicated to demos from some of these hash grant recipients. Um, On-chain AI uh, demoed Victor Fang, the chairman and CEO. He had an overview of their use of analyzing blockchain with AI. And then Invenium, Pat O'Meara, the CEO, he's discussing how Invenium facilitates the movement of data with proof of origin and proof of process in order to compute data upon demand and how these tools are being utilized within the finance industry currently. Um, so definitely take a look at those. They do a fabulous job on the presentation and walking you through their tools. Let me pause there and see if there's any questions or additional comments on those articles. Fantastic. Um, let's go ahead and move over to the next slide. You know, this is the Hyper Hyperledger uh, Wiki, and this is the Mortgage Industry Subgroup page. Um, over on the right-hand side of the page, you'll find information about the LFID and how to join it. Uh, Marvin mentioned that at the beginning of the call. On the right-hand side, you'll have the articles that I've referenced. Um, all of those are located there, along with the last couple months' worth of sessions. And then over on the far left-hand side, you'll see a number of submenu options. All of our previous recordings since 2021, um, so Al and others that are interested in checking that out, you can find those there along with links to the presentation. And we have curated uh, roughly, by the end of last year, over 250 different news articles. Um, this year alone, in just two months, or really about a month and a half, we've already uh, curated almost three dozen uh, new additional ones. But you can find old articles that we've discussed in our presentations over on the menus on the left. And if you're looking for additional information, again, feel free to, at any time to reach out to either Marvin or myself. Marvin, that's everything I've got. I'll hand it back over to you. 
Hey, thanks, James. Uh, awesome timing. I show 9.59 and it just kicked over to 10 o'clock. We probably have time for one or two questions. Uh, so we do still have some people uh, on board. Uh, anyone have uh, any questions or comments before we all sign off? Okay, um, with that, we'll just go ahead and sign off. Again, thank you to Karen for joining us and talking about Hyperledger. Here's our contact information if you do want to reach out to us and have any questions or comments. And I think that that's it. Our next meeting will be the second Thursday of March, so March 14th. I hope you join us there. Thank you, everyone.